Okay, well, um, don't have anybody online, um, but I'll record this in case uh, people are watching this asynchronously. So, um, yeah, so we're up to our um, second uh, test this week. So this week set aside for studying and reviewing the chapter three and chapter four material. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I might say one or two things about assignment two, but um, and we can see if anybody had any questions about uh, the materials or things for the tests here. So, um, maybe I'll start with that. I mean, you know, in case people missed it on the first test, uh, there are some review materials. I don't know how helpful they are. I mean, you know, I encourage you to go back and look at the, 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 the textbook as a starting point. Um, so chapter three and four, um, and then maybe look at the, uh, kind of the review questions and the actual problems at the end of those two chapters. So those are good sources of the questions that you get um, on the tests. Um, if you look under the unit two, I mean, there is um, what, um, um, there are a few, um, other things on there for, um, uh, I guess there's some slides or things, including maybe some questions at the end. Um, so some examples of some questions that you might want to think about. Um, so yeah, not, not a whole lot there on that review material, but um, you can take a look at that as well. Um, So yeah, the format is the same as the first one. Um, so let me remind you, so for the, the there is gonna be a separate folder that you can, um, um, if, if for the uh, written problems, if you do those by hand, or if you do those in an electronic document, you can upload those as long as you upload them in a reasonable amount of time after you finish um, submitting um, your test two. Um, I think the the, the questions um, on, on test two here might be uh, you might be more likely to want to write them out by hand than than just use the text box like you did for test one. So so I'll just remind people again about that. And, and you want to might you might want to make certain that um, you know that uh, before you start the test uh, that you do have that available um, um, in case you decide you want to write out the answers to the questions that you can take a picture or scan it or something or or whatever or, or you know if you're going to use word doc or whatever so just make certain you have that running stuff before you um, begin the class so, uh, but otherwise the format's the same so i think there's like three of those short answer questions and then you know like 25 to 30 multiple choice true false kind of questions um, of the same type as the first test so Um, so most of the questions will be about, yeah, I mean, you know, um, the process state transition diagrams and, um, so the seventh, the, the chapter three materials, um, on, um, processes, so, uh, you know, can you kind of name the five, seven generic process states? Can you draw those? Do you know the, the transitions between them? Describe their purpose and stuff. So a lot of stuff that hopefully the, the programming assignment kind of helps you understand those, or at least the, the basic five, the ready, running, blocked, and new, and done. Um, um, properties of processes, like What's the kind of stuff that's normally in the process control block that's kept track of by the operating system? Um, I mean, I mean, there are questions. One one of the written questions might be about like swapping in particular. So make certain that that, that you understand the difference. So I, I do still have people have a bit of confusion, don't really understand that there's a difference between a process blocking and unblocking, which is pretty normal versus a process being suspended and unsuspended. And that's also called swapping it out and swapping it back in. So that, that's that's a very kind of different process. Um, um, so most operating systems do still support swapping, although it's not as important as it used to be. Uh, but uh, at times memory just gets 
overloaded and you need to kick some things out of memory to free up some room to make it possible for other things to make some progress. So that's kind of what swapping does. Um, the difference between uh, kernel mode and user mode. So at a minimum, um, you know, in order to actually support the concept of process, we have to have um, hardware support for privileged modes um, so that um, when we get into kernel mode, only when we're in that mode are we allowed to do things like um, allocate memory and manage processes and uh, swap them out, things like that. So you don't want to allow processes to be able to do that on their own or else they would, um, the system would become unstable. So, I mean, either inadvertently or on purpose, you know, if they were malicious, um, if a process could write to memory not owned by it or could um, uh, run otherwise privileged code, um, uh, it, it basically it would be able to do anything that the operating system could do. Um, and, um, um, you know, and the operating system wouldn't have control and, and wouldn't be able to keep the system from crashing or keep the processes separate, things like that. So, so, it, so it is important that you have these um, at least two modes and, and all kind of hardware supports. Um, so, so modern CPU architectures support uh, at least something like a kernel mode versus a regular mode, a user mode. Sometimes they support uh, multiple levels than that, more than two. But, mode switching and process switching. So, um, and then, yeah, the fourth chapter was about threads. So, you know, um, I guess the most important thing about threads, as I'm thinking about it here, you know, so to kind of understand that, that thread basically extends the basic idea of a process. So, so when processes were originally created, um, the um, two sorts of separate things kind of were inside of the process. So the idea of owning resources and keeping track of which things own and are allowed to use which resources. So that ownership is part of the concept of the process. And then executing code. So the, 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 what, we, what we would call threads of execution now, right? And so initially processes only had a single thread. Um, so only, you know, only had one place where the, they were, uh, had a, a single program counter where they were fetching and executing the next instruction, right? So typically when you only have a single CPU system, so, so early um, computing systems that were only single CPU, um, you know, threads aren't as important or aren't as obvious as a useful sort of concept. But once you start getting into multi-CPU systems, multi-threading, so true parallelism um, becomes useful. And it also becomes useful though, to be able to have multiple threads, but within the same memory space. So, so sharing the same resources, right? So that, that's, that was what the, um, the p-thread um, um, question from our problem set uh, for this unit uh, was an illustration of. So threads were sharing the, the same memory. So in that case, they had access to the same global variable, the, uh, uh, the one that they were incrementing. Whatever it was called. So, um, so those those are kind of the two independent characteristics. So the idea of, of ownership of resources, including shared memory and other things. So um, files, I/O devices, um, buffers, things um, are all shared by all the threads um, that are within the same process, and then one or more multiple threads of execution um, in a multi-threading system are supported. Um, so those are kind of the two characteristics embodied um, in the concept of a process nowadays. And a modern process you know, has, has resources and it has one or more threads of, of executing code within that context of the resources that have been assigned to the process. Um, 
user level threads versus kernel level threads. You might want to read about that. Um, there'll probably be some multiple choice or true false questions on those. Uh, Anvil's law speed up. So I, I went over these in the lectures, I believe, um, the lecture videos. So, um, so yeah, there might be a question, like a short answer. That, that would make a another example of a good short answer question. So given um, the, the, the fraction of time that can be parallelized on a task and given the number of processes, can you calculate the speed up uh, using Andel's formula, which was given in chapter three or chapter four, I don't remember which, but was given in this week's materials. Um, Okay. Oops, I grabbed me by the on hang Um all right. So did you have any questions about best or something? Well, I guess the Okay. Um yeah, I was gonna review that a bit too. Can you want to talk some some things about assignment too? Um yeah, so I was going to um kind of review the second assignment. Um I did return those back. Um, there is an example of police getting posted out there. So, so did you want to ask about uh, one of the things like the um, get process? Um, so, um, um, so in the example solution, so I'll show you what, what we did here. Um, So at a minimum, uh, the, the most basic kind of data type, data structure that you needed for this assignment was something like a process table or a process control block. Um, so I thought, can I get the wrong one here? Oh. Maybe process, not the process simulator. There we go. Um, Well, people looked at the example solution, um, I used a lot of maps, or actually two maps. Um, but whatever you use, I mean, basically, um, probably the best approach was that you had something, an array or a list um, or some uh, standard template library container um, that held actual process objects. Um, and then maybe on your other list, so in this, in this, um, Example solution: the um, the process list was the only thing that actually held instances of processes, uh, and then everything else just had lists of process identifiers. So, so this was just a, the ready queue was just a queue of process identifiers, and the block list was another one of these maps of process identifiers. So, um, that makes two different yeah, so, so maps are very useful if, if you use a standard type of library. So a, a map, um, it's not completely necessary for the process list here, but, but a map maps from some arbitrary key to an arbitrary value. So in this case, we're saying that um, um, you give as like a key the, the process identifier, um, and then the map will, will be able to look up or return the actual instance in the process here, right? So you can get the same effect like with a vector because a vector um, you can use um, indexing um, operations by integers. So PIDs are just integers. So, so, so you should be able to do the same thing with a vector. I mean, in both cases, if we look at um, how the process list was used in the example solution, go ahead and find an example, or like the, um, the, the Git process, for example. Um, But to, to, to actually implement the get process function, you have to have your process table and you have to be able to use the process identifier to look it up. Um, um, so for the map, um, I think 
Maybe I'm wrong, but um, I mean, I think you can actually even use just the, uh, you know, the square bracket operator. Um, or there's a, a member function called at. So again, um, like it's good to look up um, Make sure you have reference documentation for things like this. So, remember, remind myself, you know, um, I usually get to C++.com. It usually comes up first if you search for like STL um, documentation. So, um, yeah, so, so, you know, these are all the uh, member functions that you can call on a map and it does support the, uh, the, the operator. So, um, I can't remember why I used at in my reference solution. Um, uh, I think if you if you use at, it'll throw an exception if you try and um, look up a process identifier that's not um, in there. So um, so I was doing some error checking. I don't remember if I had this as a requirement um, in the assignment description or not. So I kind of first the check that we've actually got that process, process identifier in the process list. Um, so if you do a find on a map um, and you get in as a result, that means that the, the find failed. Um, so we um, return the idle process in that case. Um, otherwise, we just look it up. But, um, but um, yeah, it should have worked also, you know, just for people's reference, they're seeing this after the fact. Uh, we, sh we should be able to use the um, um, indexing operator because maps, um, although you know, a map can take an arbitrary key and map it to an arbitrary value, so you don't have to necessarily have an integer. But we are we are using an integer. PIDs are just integers in this application. So, but, but you can look up things. You just give it the, the same type of key that you gave, and it should return it. But you can also use that to, to assign things into it as well. Um, but um, if we had a vector, um, it also supports the indexing operator. But, but the the indexes have to be integers in this case, and they have to like start at uh, zero. Um, and it's probably not defined what happens if you try to index past the end of your vector. So I mean, like regular arrays, it might not be um, it might not be um, uh, doing any error checking for you to make certain that you're not accessing uh, an item um, that's uh, not in your in your list or in your uh, vector. Um, but um, in both cases, um, yeah, I mean, again, if we had just a vector of processes, we should have been able to do about the same code here. Um, so we could have returned and used the, the indexing operator to look up the PID. Uh, we could have first checked, although in this case, um, uh, uh, for a vector, um, if, you, if you were doing some sort of checking, you might want to check that the PID is uh, like um, negative process identifier is not valid, uh, or the PID is greater than um, the uh, size of the process list. Um, again, using like a vector. So, um, so that's another thing you can ask a vector for is. Um, size here, so that should give the current number of actual objects in the vector um, that, that, you, that you've actually put into it um, at this point. So. Um, so I'd say, yeah, I mean, if you're using a vector, it might be a little bit different um, how, how you do things, but um, um, should be, the, the, the main thing is whatever data structure you're using, you need to be able to, met, to, to get from the process identifier to an actual process. So we're returning an actual 
instance of a process here. So, um, and so somewhere, I mean, somewhere you, you will have to have, you know, actual processes, you know, not just process pointers um, or, um, or PID, um, but what the process would be either dynamically created or being stored in, in an array or, or a vector or something like that. Um, Go back to what we had. So I can make sure I can keep compiling this. Um, see, so yeah, I mean, another common problem, um, not too many people were having it um, on this class, but um, you do have to be careful um, if you do keep actual processes anywhere else besides the process list. Um, so like if, if so at least one person, or maybe two, one, one or two groups or people uh, were, were using like a, a list or a, a queue um, of actual processes um, for the ready queue. Um, the issue here can be that um, like, you know, when you assign something, say, um, onto the ready queue like this, if it's actual processes, you're actually gonna be making a copy uh, of the object. Um, and then when you pull it back off, um, you get uh, yet another copy potentially. So the problem can be that if you do things like uh, call um, the, the methods to change the state of the process or other things, um, you have to be careful that you're changing it um, on the one that you're actually using globally, uh, not, not the one that you have on your, um, it might be a copy that was made onto like a queue or a, a list of block processes or things like that. So, um, so that was why in the example solution, you know, again, we, we, we explicitly just made it um, in this example um, that there was only one, one and only one place where there was actual processes created um, and um, you. So if you look in the, um, the the new event, that's the only place where processes were created uh, and put into this map um, here. So the new event was called um, whenever new uh, happens in the simulation. Um, so when you do something like this, this actually instantiates a new process instance. Um, and this new process instance is actually local. You know, so anytime you create a variable inside of a, um, uh, a function, all variables are gonna be local. They're gonna be on the stack unless you create them dynamically. So using new to create on the heap. So in this case, it's actually local, but when you, when you do the assignment like this, um, this will actually copy that process that, that's local here into the map. So here, here, you know, again, we're uh, showing the use of the um, the square bracket indexing operator to to assign that new process to the particular uh, process ID within our process list map. But, but again, if you used it like a vector, or um, I keep coming back to a vector because you know I don't think like for example STL lists uh, you support the um, 
uh, indexing operator. So if you look at the STL list, you won't see um, the, the, the square bracket, bracket operator to get the value of index. So if you wanted to use a regular list um, for your um, process list or your process control block, um, if you wanted to, to look up things by process identifier, um, you'd have to do some kind of search uh, in here using something like um, surely there's some way to find uh, maybe not. So, so yeah, I mean, list may not be good at all uh, if you can't at least. Um, um, search a particular index. And you can iterate through the values of a list. Um, so go from the front to the back to search it. So you could do that if you had to, if you were determined to use a list, but that might be a bit um, inefficient. Um, I thought there was a fine, but maybe I'm wrong. So this is where it kind of helps to um, So these containers are meant to be used uh, in certain ways so that they'll be efficient for certain kinds of operations um, and not for others. Um, So yeah, um, I mean, refreshing my memory, um, lists um, in general aren't kind of uh, randomly accessible very easily. So um, that makes it inefficient to implement the uh, get process method, for example, using less. So, so, so it probably would have been best to use uh, a vector, um, definitely, um, if you're not using a map or something else here. Or an array, yeah, so an array um, would have been another option because it, it uh, arrays can give you something that's pretty much that can be used like a regular array, like a regular old style C array, um, but um, um, so, so it also has the indexing operator. Um, Cat operator. Um, but yeah, ar arrays are meant to be uh, kind of fixed size sequences. So you can't, uh, so, so again, like, like a regular uh, C array, if you use a standard template library array, you really do have to specify um, at the beginning what the maximum size is, so, which is a bit of a limitation of it. Anyway, so yeah, I'm kind of getting off track talking about standard template library containers. So the different containers you could have used. Um, so kind of back to this map though. So it does allow you to um, use it. To, so again, if, if you're using a regular array in C or you were using um, the, the standard template library array or the standard template library vector, your implementation uh, for all those would look pretty similar to what we did on new event here. If you had, um, you know, vectors of processes or arrays of processes or just use an old style C array of processes. Um, your new events, you know, you'd create, you'd have to create the new process somehow and then stick it into your data structure so you can look it up by the process identifier uh, later on. So. Um, but, um, I think I, I talked about this maybe in, in the videos where I, for the standard template library, um, I, I talked, had some videos about using standard template library containers. So uh, in this example, you know, I used a list. Um, I mean, some people were using other, were using the actual Q type. There is an actual Q type. Um, the, the problem with the, the Q type for this assignment is that um, normally for a Qs, um, you don't ever iterate over all the items in the queue. So you don't need to be able to see any item except for the item at the front of the queue, and maybe the item at the back of the queue. 
So, so if you look at the Q container um, in the C++ standard library, Um, you know, you, you can push and pop things to the front and find the item at the back and the front to turn them, turn them as empty, but it doesn't define the things to iterate over the items in the queue, um, which, um, so, so there, there's actually no way, once you put items on the queue, to, to go back and see, okay, what items do I currently have in my queue? Now, what are the items besides the front and the back items that I have? Um, so some, some people did use a queue, but then um, in order to implement the extra credit would do things like uh, make a copy of the queue um, and then, you know, pop the items off the front so you could display it um, in the, um, um, so, so th this was just for extra credit, but um, to, to, to get all the system tests to pass, you had to write a little bit of code in the two string method. Um, so if you use like a list, this is what I'm talking about here. It makes it easy to implement um, this two string method because a list allows you to iterate over the items in the list. So in this case, um, um, my ready queues were just a regular list. So, so I can iterate, it is a regular list of process identifiers. So I can iterate over those. Um, and um, in my case, again, those are only process identifiers. So I had to actually go to my process list to pull the item out, uh, to pull, to get the actual process uh, instance. And so, so we get the process identifier, we pull that out and this, this will output the information about each process on the ready queue um, in the correct order from, you know, so the item at the head will come out first in this iteration and then the item, the next item back through down to the tail item or the, the back item uh, here. Um, so yeah, if, if you used a queue, you know, you couldn't do something quite as clean like this. You had to um, like maybe make a copy of your queue into a temporary queue um, and then, you know, uh, get, get the item at the, the, the front of your queue so you could display it and then pop that item off so you'd be actually modifying your queue, which is why it's a good idea to make a copy of the queue. Um, and and um, um, you know, if you have a copy of the queue, you could just throw it away after you're done processing it. But, but yeah, pop the item off the front so that, that you'd be able to get access to the next item, which was behind the head or the front of the queue um, and so on. So, and two people do that. And that's okay. I mean, you, you know, you got it to work, but um, um, that's kind of where, you know, taking some thought about these containers and being familiar with, with the data types that you have in your language um, is useful, you know. So, I mean, if, if I didn't have this requirement in this assignment, I would have just used a queue if I didn't have to um, print these out, uh, display these in the, uh, the, the two string method. But since we had that, you know, um, we wanted a container not only that can be used as a queue, but that we can iterate over so, so we can get all the items out of it um, in, in the order that they're on that uh, queue. And, and a list allows you to directly do that. So, um, A list um, has all the queue semantics on it in STL. So it has um, um, and um, in fact, I believe that if you use a queue behind the scenes, it actually uses a list, or maybe in the, no, it uses a list because a queue needs to be dynamic. Um, so you need to be able to, you know, the, the, the size of the items on the queue has to be able to grow and shrink um, and lists can do that rather, rather efficiently. They, they use some sort of a linked list kind of representation. Um, to implement the lists. So. so you can iterate over list fairly efficiently and um, uh, um, and you can easily put things onto the front or the back because of their, uh, it's, I think it's like a double linked list um, is the normal um, 
kind of backing data structure that, that's used uh, in, in, in the list type. Uh, but yeah, because of that, then you can do things like find the, the back and the front item. Um, and you can push on the back and push on the front. Because it allows you to push and pop on the back and front, you can use lists both as a, a stack or as a queue uh, relatively easily if we have to, but then also have the ability to get to the internals, to get all to the to get to the items in the middle of your um, um, list um, if you need them for different reasons. Um, so, You bring up the assignment description. So that, that's probably most of the things that I've been thinking about, kind of pointing out. Uh, let's, let's look at the tasks one more time. Um, let's look at the, the basic uh, dispatch timeout and CPU event. Um, which which kind of form the, the three basics for moving between ready and running here. So so um, um, So for a lot of these, you had to do something like first check that the whether the CPU was idle or not before you did anything. So, so these these events in the simulation could be called. So they're just called whenever the um, the, the corresponding event happens when we read it in from the uh, the file. Um, so it was up to the simulator to determine whether you know there's actually anything to be dispatched or timed out or or you know have a CPU cycle happen on or things like that. So, so there's lots of ways you could have checked. Um, probably if I didn't if I didn't comment it on, um, it, it's really best to reuse functions. So in, instead of you know so so like the is CPU idle? Um, I believe you had to implement. You probably did because uh, it might depend on on how you. It, it definitely you had to implement is CPU idle because you had to keep track of what the process was on the CPU. Um, so in this simulation, we're just uh, in, in this example solution, um, we just added a member variable called CPU, which is a process identifier, um, and so this will be set to the uh, the PID of zero, which we use to indicate um, a, a, a bad process identifier or the idle process or it'll be non-zero, so it'll be one or greater um, when the CPU is not idle, right? So, you know, you could have done other things for this, but, but that's um, a fairly simple way to, to keep track of what's running on the CPU or not. Uh, and that means to check if the CPU is idle, um, um, you would do something like just check whether it's equal to the idle PID. So if, if CPU, the PID on the CPU is currently equal to the idle CPU, then it's true. So we were referring through that uh, the CPU is idle. And if CPU was not zero, so if CPU was one, this would return false, which is what you want uh, here. Um, so, but I was bringing that up because you know a lot of people instead of reusing this, so so uh, this is something that um, if I didn't I didn't give a comment to this for everybody. Uh, on the code for this assignment, but uh, uh, there's a principle known as don't repeat yourself. So whenever you have something like this, the, the, like, like the is CPU idle function, which is supposed to be implementing the check for the simulation um, that gives the definitive answer, you know, is the, current, is the CPU currently idle or not idle? Um, you should be reusing this instead of 
doing the code or, or especially instead of doing it different ways, which is a comment I had for a few people. So sometimes people were checking their CPU, uh, sometimes they were checking um, other things, you know, so, so doing it, uh, you know, depending on how, what data structures you use, there's potentially multiple ways you could have determined if your CPU was idle or not. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so, you know, it, it's good programming practice not to repeat code like that. So, you know, instead of explicitly checking if CPU is equal to idle, you should always be reusing functions like this um, um, in, in your classes. Because you know another reason why you don't repeat, repeat yourself. If if I decided that I needed to represent what is running um, in the system a different way than like the CPU variable with the process identifier, um, in order to change the the implementation of this CPU idle, you know I don't have to change it one place as long as I'm always reusing the is CPU idle function here. Right? But but if you if you copy that code to check you know, the, the CPU is equal to um, idle, uh, whenever you need to check if the CPU is idle or not. If, if you end up modifying how you keep track of what's running on the CPU, you'd have to find all the places where you did that um, and, and update that instead of having it just in one place. So the don't repeat yourself allows for reuse and it makes it easier to refactor things um, um, if you decide to change your mind. Um, and, and do things slightly differently. Usually you don't have to change it at that one place. Um, likewise for dispatch, you had to check if the, if I, if the CPU was idle. Um, and also there, in order to dispatch something, there had to be something on the ready queue. Um, so most likely people's implementation of this would have looked pretty similar. So you had to have something that you could use as a queue um, and, um, and be able to check whether, whether the queue is empty or not. So uh, I guess you could have checked, like if you're keeping track of the number of processes you had on the ready queue, you could check that number variable instead of directly calling your queue to see if it's empty or not. So, um, But yeah, in, in this example, a solution, since everything except for the process list is really just these process identifiers. So, you know, so there's no, there's no, um, it's pretty safe to like, uh, you know, get these things off. So, so, so if we get the item off the front of the ready queue um, and just remove it, um, but that gives us the process identifier, we need to use that um, as an index into our map in this case. Uh, but again, if you're using a vector or an array, uh, it would look similar. Um, but, but yeah, we use that to get the actual process object to, to um, do the things we need to do to um, dispatch the process itself um, and then uh, keep track of um, our CPU in the simulation, what's currently running on it now. So, so, so yeah. again, this code, you know, initially we guaranteed that, that the, um, The CPU um, was not idle, right? So, um, or, I mean, we guaranteed that after we got past this point, the CPU was actually idle. Nothing was running on it. So um, if, if there's nothing running on CPU, it's safe to, I mean, we want to um, dispatch the next process and get it off the front of the ready queue um, and, and, and assigning our CPU to be that process that we just uh, dispatched and, and, and transitioned from a ready state to a running state. You know. um, so I guess CPU event was a little bit simpler than I remembered or should have been for most people. You had to increment the system time, 
Um, and then if the CPU wasn't idle, you had to be able to use your data structure to find the, the running process and then implement, you know, call the CPU cycle on the process. So this was mainly how you simulated um, the, the, the time quantum being incremented and the total amount of time being used by the process being incremented were both handled um, inside of our process object by calling CPU cycle here. Um, And then timeout um, allows to use the um, time slice quantum. Um, so if the CPU isn't idle, um, you have to have some way of knowing what the current running process is on your CPU and accessing it, and then querying whether its time quantum has been exceeded or not uh, yet. And if it has, you have to time it out. Um, I'll time out on the process um, and put it back onto the ready queue. And then finally, the CPU is actually idle at that point once you've timed it out and, and, and removed it and put it back on the ready queue. Um, So yeah, I mean, if you look at all those, I don't know if anybody kind of looked in the, um, the, the, the code for how the actual simulation works in this case. So all of these simulations for the assignments for this class will probably have like a main function called something like run simulation, um, which is how we get into and actually uh, perform a full simulation. Uh, usually you won't have to actually modify those, you'll be given those, but the, if you look at the, the main loop, I mean, basically all it's doing um, is um, um, reading in those events from the simulation file. Um, and if it's you know, new, it calls the new event, CPU calls CPU event. If it's a block, it calls the block event. If it's unblocked, it calls the unblock event and so on. Okay. Um, Uh, the, the only thing, yeah, I kind of wanted to point out a little bit about the simulation here. Um, the only tricky part is that basically there, there, there is no explicit call to like dispatch and timeout. So what's happening, if you look on the main event loop for the simulation here, is that um, um, every time before we read the next event, we first check if the CPU is idle by calling dispatch and dispatching the process if we need to. And then we read in the next event of the simulation. And then after that, so, so you know, potentially, for example, the next event was like a, a CPU cycle. So after that, it could be that the current running process um, might have uh, uh, exceeded its time slice quantum. So, so for every loop, you know, we, we, um, after we do that, um, we um, um, call timeout, right? Um, so that's how those hooks are getting into the code we had to write, for like the dispatch and the timeout um, and the CPU event. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, I kind of want to wrap up. Um, um, after that, I mean, um, there, there was some things then for keeping track of blocked processes, so blocking and unblocking them. Um, so again, in the example solution, we, we use a map. Um, so here, like, like I kind of talked about, you, know, you don't have to use a map, um, but uh, in fact, you, you, some people didn't use anything at all. Um, so, I mean, you could just use your process list because that has all your processes. So you could, if, if you could search through or iterate through your process list, you could have search through those one by one whenever you had to, um, like, for example, unblock on a particular event ID, looking for the process that was blocked on that event ID. But the, but the map makes it relatively easy. So if, uh, again, if we um, 
index or map by the event ID. Um, the, um, The, the, the block event becomes relatively uh, simple. Um, so, although, um, yeah, I guess since I threw in, you know, so, so checking if the CPU is idle, so it doesn't make sense for a block to happen if there's nothing running on the CPU because the block is supposed to be that something was running and um, it uh, needs to do something like IO, so it becomes blocked. So, so, so that most people should have been able to do. Uh, but, but yeah, depending on how you implemented um, your block list, it, you might have made it easier or harder on yourself to do the second thing I asked for, uh, which was um, to check if there was um, already something waiting on that particular event that we're blocking on, right? So to check that, again, you have to um, um, be able to search uh, the processes that are blocked and, and uh, find uh, if any process is blocked on that particular event ID, right? So for a map, it makes it relatively easy because I can just use, I can just look up in my block list. I can find if anything is waiting on that particular event ID. Um, and this will return the actual uh, process ID in my block list. Um, so it returns in if there's nothing waiting on that event, in which case it's safe for me to go ahead and block the current process on that event ID. Uh, but if it doesn't return in, that means there's something already um, waiting on that process identifier um, and you were supposed to throw an exception in that case. Um, so if you use something like a vector or, or a list for your blocked list, you would have had to iterate over uh, each one of your items in your block list um, and one by one check, you know, and fall um, the uh, is waiting on event um, for the process to do the same sort of thing here. And same thing for the unblock. So for the other end, um, for um, for the map, um, you can just look it up by the event ID. So so since we're mapping by event ID, we can pull it out. And although we've kind of first checked, uh, I guess you had to do this too. Um, so you had to first determine if, um, if, um, if if unblock was being called, but we had nothing waiting on that event. Again, that doesn't really make sense in terms of this sort of simple simulation. So um, we should never have an unblock happening um, when we have no process um, that was blocked on that event. So, um, but otherwise, um, um, whatever you're using for your data structure, you'd have to find that process that was waiting on that particular event ID and then call unblock on it. So for the map, to remove something from the map, you have to call a race. For like a, a vector or a list, um, you have to do something um, um, similar to remove something um, from the, uh, the middle of the item, the middle of the list. Um, like call the remove function. Um, so, so yeah, I guess it's called like remove on list. Um, it may not be a remove on vectors. It might not be easy to remove if you use, try to use a vector for your block list and you might not be able to, to get things out really easily doing that. Nor for array probably. So you probably want to, probably need to use a list or a map um, or what else can you use? Maybe a double ended queue where it's kind of like a list. So that would have worked too. Um, 
All right, and yeah, there was done event, and that was pretty much it, I think. Um, so I think the only other thing, last thing I'll kind of mention maybe is that um, if you're running the um, system tests, um, some people essentially got uh, even the extra credit correct, um, but weren't quite passing all the system tests. Um, um, so, um, you know, just to let you know, um, um, the system tests, uh, in this case, we're expecting the, uh, the block list to be in a particular order. So to have the things ordered by the event ID, um, um, you know, so, so the one with the lowest event ID comes out first on the block list, and then the second lowest event ID came out second and so on. So, um, so that would be why um, uh, you might have pretty much had it working, uh, even including the extra credit, but weren't quite passing all the system tests. Um, um, so you had the right items on the block list, they just weren't coming out in the same order that was expected on the, um, uh, the reference solution here. Um, all right. So I think I'll wrap up then. Did you want to ask questions about that? I don't know. I was just a whole like struggling by the implementing the vector vector one. Because that's that falls struggling with the most when you're all trying to. 